Welcome to our 9 a.m. press conference. This is about setting boundaries for the Anthropocene. I'm trying a new pronunciation. And our speakers, in order of speaking, are Michael Ellis. He'll give an introduction. He's head of climate change science at the British Geological Survey. Tony Brown is director of the Paleo Environmental Laboratory at the University of Southampton in the UK. Michael Krug is professor of the Department of Earth and Environmental Studies at Montclair State University in Montclair, New Jersey. And Colin Waters is the principal mapping geologist, British Geological Survey Environment Science Center in Nottingham, UK. So at the outset, let's make it clear, it's actually the Anthropocene. Um, so the reason for this is, is in part because of the session tomorrow morning I think that has caught the eye of AGU. But it's, it's important to note that there are Anthropocene sessions all, all through the, the week. And that fact alone demonstrates that this is resonant across uh, a huge variety of scientific disciplines. And it's also resonant, we've come to know and come to understand across a wide variety of other stakeholders. And that, that diagram, um, or that, that cover from The Economist of May 26, 2011, um, demonstrates that, that resonance very clearly. So, um, heaven forbid that I would l attempt to load the, the media with, with questions, um, but the questions that I've listed there are the ones that, are, that appeal to me and that, that speak to the fact that this is a writ large uh, concept. So, for example, an obvious and first order question that occurs to everybody is, when did it begin or has it begun? And I, I suspect that will occupy uh, um, many for many years to come and so on. But it's not the only question, and it, it could be argued that it's not even the most interesting question. What is it in the first place? Um, I think you know that it, it is being proposed as a new geological epoch or a period or a geological, a formal time unit in the geological canon of, of, of time. Um, so what is it? How would you recognize it? If you were to go to a soil, could you, could you recognize a, an Anthropocene soil or would it be a soil of, of, of 10 million years ago? Is there something to distinguish it? What are the biological markers of the Anthropocene? Um, we are comfortable now with the fact that humans are clearly geological agents. We know that we move more mass around the Earth, with a couple of important exceptions, such as ocean currents, but certainly more mass around on the land surface than any natural process. And that, that word natural is, needs to be in, in quotation marks, because, of course, we are as natural as any other process that we would identify with just a conscious natural. Um, if we, if we acknowledge that humans are geological agents, then do we also need to acknowledge that societies are geological agents in, in a sense of, um, well, in a sense of regulatory bodies, for example, whether they are governments, whether they are uh, global institutions, such as the UN. The, the, the import of, of regulations, uh, international law, for example, and specifically, has a huge impact on the, the generation and the preservation of the Anthropocene. If we have an Anthropocene landscape, for example, it is there because largely of policies that are generated in those uh, um, legislation bodies, those regulatory bodies. Um, and last but not least, and perhaps, perhaps most divergent from the scientific community at the AGU is, is this notion of the concept itself. Is the Anthropocene concept capable of changing the normative, beha normative behavior of humans um, so that there's a potential for feedbacks? In other words, if we're faced with the, with the potential um, for there being a new geological epoch because of our behavior, 
will that process of recognition finally be sufficient to, to change our behavior to then either be a negative feedback on the Anthropocene so that it disappears next week, or that it continues and becomes uh, a, a long-lived geological epoch. So that, that, those few words sort of skitter across the surface of an enormously diverse array of questions that come not just from geophysics, but from social economics, um, from the geography discipline, and, and from the biological discipline, and so on and so on. Okay. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to, to uh, Tony Brown from the University of Southampton to talk about the Anthropocene landscape, I think. Right, thank you, Mike, for setting the scene. The Anthropocene, if it's to be a geological period, it has to be visible in the geological record, but I mean visible in a, a wider way than just, if you like, necessarily be able to be seen by us, by instruments as well, of course. So, there is an obvious problem with doing this, and that is we should really be sitting here in about 100,000 years' time, or possibly even a million years' time, looking back to identify the beginning of a new geological period because geology, of course, as we all know, is historical science. So in the absence of time travel, we've got to try and work out whether we really do have enough grounds for producing a new geological period. So since we can't travel into the future. As Mike mentioned, we now know that the majority of the movement of terrestrial mass on, on, the, uh, on the continents is due to human activity. And in some places, human activity certainly started to dominate over natural rates of transfer of soil and sediment quite a long time ago. This is, shows both the, the, if you like, the, the reason for the Anthropocene and in a way also the problem. These are two catchments in the, on the small island of the UK on the left, we've got one called the, uh, the Froome, and on the right, we've got one called the, the Colm. They're both small catchments. They're about 300 square kilometers in size. They're about the same relief. They're not different in any major geological way. But you can see both of them have a thick top unit that dominates the, the floodplain that sits along the river and makes up the modern floodplain. In the case of the Froome, it is over five meters thick of uniform, sandy, silty clay. It was actually recognized way back in the 1970s as, as a unit that you could map across Midland, the Midlands of England. And we now know by dating it that it dates from around about 4,000 years ago. It prostates the deforestation of the catchment and it's related to an intensification of agriculture that happened in the European Bronze Age in this catchment. But if we move just 100 kilometers to the southwest of England, we see another catchment, the same size, very similar geology. It has a series of dates, and these dates have come both from uh, OSL dating and radiocarbon dating, and there's a lot of dates on these two catchments. We there see a similar unit sitting on top of the organic old floodplain and the gravels of the old floodplain, creating a new sedimentary formation and that dates only from between around 500, maybe the oldest date is 1,000, but most of the dates are actually only about three or 400 years ago. That catchment was deforested in the Bronze Age, not quite so completely. There's a different land use history in the Southwest. And also agriculture was not so complete, and there was still a lot of woodland left in that catchment, buffering the fluvial system until really enclosure in the historical period. So we can clearly see here an anthropogenic unit, which is very significant in the valleys, in both valleys, but we can see that the date of formation varies by probably three to three and a half thousand years. And if we get, extend this out, we can see this same difference between the lower natural floodplain in all of our river valleys uh, in other areas, such as North America. Classic work here 
by, uh, originally by Hap and Gilbert and Leopold, uh, more recently uh, work by uh, Knox and Brackenridge and Trimble and Montgomery, and you can see in the middle picture there a, a difference, a really obvious geological boundary. There's absolutely no way you could miss it between the old floodplain and the new floodplain. And that will persist. Even possibly, even through glaciation, it could persist. Because when we look at previous interglacials, we do not see this hiatus in the middle of the warm period. And we've even got a budget for it. There's the famous budget from, from Coon Creek, Coon Creek uh, produced by Stan Trimble. And evidence has increased in other areas, too, of post-European alluviation. This is some uh, evidence from Australia. Again, we see in lots of their floodplains, lots of the sequences, we see this paleosol, and above it is a large unit, which is post-European settlement and agriculture. And most excitingly of all, we're starting to see it in parts of Africa. Now, Africa is much more complicated for climatic reasons and also because of the patchy nature of the uptake of agriculture in different parts of the continent. But here's an example from Mali, where there's a, a large change in sedimentation around about 4,000 years ago, and agriculture stepped up in this catchment during that period. This has been done on the basis of, of uh, phytolith analysis as well as OSL dating. So, what's caused this? Well, fundamentally, this change in alluviation is a change in the state of the catchments, and they've gone from these catchments, I'm a, Obviously, they weren't all necessarily tropical rainforests. That's a picture of tropical rainforests. A lot of them were. But they were basically rainforest or savanna or forest of some kinds with a whole series of fauna and flora associated with those ecosystems. They've gone from that to agricultural systems, be they pastoral systems, be they arable systems. And, of course, along with that, we've had the extinction, the last great extinction event, which really is not dis in dispute, and we've had the rise of all the domesticates. So fundamentally, and those domesticates, not only the obvious ones, but also include things like the synanthropes. Those are things which have changed in abundance because of the rise of the number of human beings on the surface of the earth called synanthropes. And that includes bacteria, and it includes diseases even. So that's the reason that, that we've got this change in sedimentation which we can see across the continent. And so that, that, that we can just make a few statements from the basis of that. So firstly, there is a visible and nearly global change in terrestrial and, and in fact, uh, coastal shelf sedimentation. But it, it occurs basically over between the last four and 5,000 years because it, it occurs in different, different times, different, uh, different places. The minimum of geological boundaries, it's worthwhile remembering, with the notable exception of the Pleistocene-Holocene boundary, which has been fixed in a rather different manner to previous geological boundaries, is about 5,000 years. So it's actually, that's the, the, the highest resolution you can really pin it to on the basis of, of, um, of um, paleomagnetics. So it's about the same order of magnitude, really, as the diachrony that we see in this change in alluviation uh, on, the, uh, on the continents. So therefore, it throws up a question. So there may be a case, and I think we'll all discuss this case, there may be a case, but in the end we're dealing with a historical science and the history of establishing boundaries is one of pragmatics as much as it is of theory. So there are perhaps three possible options that I'm sure will be addressed by the, the other speakers and also addressed in the sessions on the Anthropocene in this conference. We can pick an arbitrary a recent date um, this is the sort of super pragmatic approach. Some spike, such as radionuclide spike, but it would have to be a long-lived one. It's no good if it decays, if it's unmeasurable after about 20 or 30 years. Um, uh, the other alternative is to go for the population, because fundamentally this is clearly related to population. Although, as I've shown, it's really related to agriculture. And population, of course, lags well behind agriculture because its rise is really associated with industrialization, which was driven eventually by agriculture. We could recognize a globally synchronous boundary um, creating, a, um, um, but if we, uh, sorry, a globally diachronous boundary, so we could regard it as being diachronous. The problem with that is that that means that the Holocene ended at different times in different places, and that's probably even more problematic. And the last possibility is that we think 
It is so different, it is so major, and fundamentally it relates to uh, a combination of natural variability plus the anthropogenic effect that it sits on top of normal geology. I mean, after all, its origins lie really in uh, work on atmospheric chemistry, on, on global environmental change. So you could say, well, in fact, it doesn't fit the normal model of geological time periods. So perhaps we need a completely different type of time period. And that might also turn out to be a pragmatic approach. morning. So I'm, in a way, I guess, picking up where Tony left off his, uh, his point A in his last slide, so I'm going to uh, elaborate a little bit on, on that point and talking about uh, possible chemical contaminants as stratigraphic markers for the Anthropocene, or at least perhaps for the onset of the Anthropocene. So I'd just like to refer to the uh, stratigraphic column for the Phanerozoic, which happened to be one of theirs from the BGS uh, website, which is a very nice one. So uh, as you know, the divisions of geologic timescale initially based on major changes that pioneering geologists noticed in the fossil record. So more recently, chemical changes have also been noted at some of these uh, original boundary layers. So we have a famous example, of course, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary or Mesozoic Cenozoic boundary, marked by, among other things, the famous uh, iridium spike uh, noted by uh, Walter Alvarez and others. And here's an example. You see these pretty much all over the planet. Here's one from, um, from one of the ocean drilling project sites. And uh, so it's a, the time scale here is about one million years, going from 65 to about 66 on the bottom of this, this chart. And you could see, uh, maybe you, no pointer here, but there's the, the spike increase in the amount of iridium. And so perhaps something like that then uh, might uh, be found by, let's say, do the thought experiment here. Imagine hypothetical geologists in the very distant future looking for chemical or geochemical markers left behind by us. So if we zoom in then at the very top of the, uh, of the um, geologic column, blow that up a little bit. And what I've taken the liberty is I've actually extended the column 20 million years on the left side here into the future to help us get some perspective. So if we're sitting basically on the top here, 10 million years hence, and if there were some type of, of life form that could produce geologists at, at that uh, point, perhaps long after the extinction of our species and our civilization, what might they look for? So uh, this is now, of course, a linear time scale drawn to the, uh, so you can see actually the width of each of the uh, uh, time, uh, bound, time uh, horizons. So we have to actually expand it quite a bit to switch from millions of years to tens of thousands of years to even begin to focus in. And I drew a red line here for the Industrial Revolution as maybe kind of a convenient uh, place to begin thinking about the beginning of the Anthropocene. So um, again, if we take the perspective from, from the distant future, what might we see? So hypothetical uh, uh, geologists looking for chemical markers. So, um, so I'm proposing a few. Among them would be polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, some of which are quite long-lived. And of course, they may be produced by non-anthropogenic means. We could have them from, for example, natural forest or grassland fires. But there are chemical ways or molecular ways to distinguish, uh, let's say, a fingerprint of the human-caused, uh, uh, human combustion-related uh, uh, PAHs. And there's just one little uh, chart from the literature showing over a uh, little, little more than 100 years a, sort of a background level, and as we get into um, the 20th century, middle of the 20th century, we see a big, big spike of these of these compounds 
in uh, sediment core. And we can go all over the world and find these uh, kinds of things mentioned in the literature. You see a very similar pattern. So a very nice spike is available here. And of course, um, we think about, well, how much longer will we be burning fossil fuels in, in enormous quantities like we're doing now? Petroleum, coal, natural gas. So eventually, perhaps these things will run out or we'll find a different Source, different sources of energy, so perhaps there'll be a nice, uh, a nice uh, bell curve to this spike eventually. Of course, we can do the same thing with lead, uh, and these would all be uh, atmospherically distributed, uh, very widespread fashion all over the planet, but especially concentrated closer to urban areas, areas with uh, major populations. Lead is an interesting one because it was used quite a bit more when leaded gasoline was widespread in many countries now being phased out. So you can actually see the, the curve kind of back off and, and reduce, in, at least in uh, uh, Europe and, and North America. Mercury is another nice one to follow, but there could be many more of these types of substances. Anyway, so that's basically my, my little uh, uh, contribution here, just to begin to think about this kind of thing, mainly, again, for the onset of the Anthropocene. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I've, I've got some handouts, uh, which were partly the, the presentation, but also the two posters I'm giving tomorrow, which uh, cover some of the aspects I'm going to be talking about now. Um, my sort of aspect of research is more uh, to do with the actual physical deposits that, that man is leaving, so not so much the sort of the indirect natural components that, that Tony was talking about beforehand, but the physical man-made deposits. These have been typically um, more of the realm of the archaeologist in the past. Uh, and what we're hoping is that by studying these deposits in the way that geologists would typically study natural deposits, we, we're looking at them in a different context. We can look at the large-scale quantification of these deposits rather than the small-scale um, assessment of individual sites to, to determine their history of occupation. We're also hoping by looking at the analysis of global mineral statistics to be able to come up with a uh, a means of determining the, the, the scale of the excavation that, that man is carrying out at present and how much material is being trans transported um, with time and how to then relate that to the, the amount of material that's been uh, transported naturally and also determine as to whether there's any changes in the rates of accumulation with time because it will be that aspect that probably recognises what we might consider to be the Anthropocene. So this, this impinges on what Tony was talking about before. Uh, so the, this box diagram, if, you, if you're looking on the, the y-axis towards the top, uh, the materials are predominantly artificial or novel materials. And to the right, um, we're having a more man-made or anthropogenic type environment of formation. So the types of things that Tony was talking about before would be on the left-hand side. So we would have, for example, what we might consider to be the sort of natural alluvium deposits, and that's maybe to some extent a, a, a concept that's not realistic anymore in this, on this planet, but that would plot down in the bottom left-hand corner of the figure. And then you'd have what we might consider the indirect anthropogenic deposits. These are the ones which, uh, shown by four in the top left, um, are essentially natural sediments but include a component of, of man-made material, so perhaps reworking uh, things like colliery spoil, or may contain bits of garbage. So that would plot higher up on, on the, the figure, so at four here. Uh, but also then there's the, the human modification of the environment. So you're getting what essentially look like natural deposits, but accumulating within a man-made environment, which is, in this case, a reservoir. So Tony's talked about those. Our focus is more on the, the right-hand side of the figure, which are the directly deposited man-made deposits. Uh, we call them artificial ground, artificial deposits. Um, and there's a continuum, really, between uh, deposits which are almost entirely made of novel materials. So the example on the top right there is actually a spoil tip of, of toilets, waste toilets that uh, have just been smashed up, uh, purely, purely man-made materials, 
the continuum then goes down to um, what looks like natural deposits. This is down in Abu Dhabi. Um, so the, the actual lithologies there are all natural, but they've been clearly moved by man, in this case by a bulldozer, basically grading the material laterally as it's digging out an area for development. So we're going to concentrate for the rest of this talk on these um, more directly deposited human deposits. Uh, in many respects, you can, you can analyze them in the same way we would look at rocks. Um, and I'll just pick out one particular way that we can, we can deal with these, and that's how you would date them. Uh, geologists would tend to use fossils. Uh, archaeologists have used artifacts. Um, in the past, it would have been things like pot sherds, uh, flints. Uh, but you can use the same techniques for, for dating these deposits, even though they're relatively recent. Um, and so this is just an example here where you can start to look at, say, Bakelite, which was invited, invented in 1907. Uh, for a few decades, it would have been, oh, it would have been a very uh, minor component in any uh, spoil tips uh, or landfill sites. Then really became quite a, a significant product uh, from about 1920s through to about 1950s, when it was then superseded by plastics. And so, though you'll still find that some products are made of Bakelite, they're fairly rare. Uh, or relatively minor, but you'll still find them appearing in any, any landfill sites. Now, if you, look, if you look at all of those components and treat them in their entirety, you'll start to, to see examples of materials where you're going to get a deposit with bits of Bakelite, Coca-Cola bottles, tin cans, types of batteries. The amalgam of all of those will give you some approximation to the age of that deposit. And so far, we've been talking largely about superficial uh, human deposits, but, but also increasingly were affecting the subsurface. Uh, and in the, the lower figure, that's to show you that the, the sort of near surface, the top, top 10 meters or so, is being uh, actively reworked, a form of amphorotubation of materials. So you're getting um, excavations for cellars, uh, you're getting uh, utility pipelines, uh, and also transport, transport tunnels developing. So it's continually reworking the sediments. But even at greater depths, down to several kilometers, we're starting to see extraction of minerals, so hydrocarbons, um, coal. Uh, we're getting also extraction of groundwater, so we're putting down deep boreholes. Uh, also, uh, increasingly development of geological disposal facilities and storage facilities. So all these are affecting, at great depth, the, the nature of the geology. Um, and interestingly, it's probably those deeper deposits and, and structures are the ones that are going to be preserved in the future. So the geologist of the future is going to see those and ponder how they formed, rather than the sufficient material that's been continually uh, uh, reworked and eroded. So now we're going on to the, the aspects of, of volume of material that's been generated. And I, I thank here um, my colleagues Tony Cooper and Teresa Brown, who've done most of the mineral statistics analysis. Um, and first of all, I'm going to look at the issue of um, mineral extraction. Uh, this is one of the most significant pr producers of spoil material within, on the planet. Uh, and some of the, the major mineral extraction is for coal and iron ore. Uh, so we've got figures from 2010 of coal extraction of about 7,000 million tons, iron ore 2,600 million tons. These are these big figures. What do they mean? Well, if you look at uh, the, the pyramid at Cheops, Giza, that's estimated to be about 6 million tons. So we're talking or already annually coal extraction being about 1,100 times greater than, than the, the, the mass of that pyramid. So the big figures. Uh, coal, obviously, we burn the coal generally. Um, so a lot of that goes up in CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, but there's also residues, ash material. So that's, in effect, forming a, an, an artificial deposit. Um, but that's only a small part of the story, because increasingly with time, uh, it's becoming economic to, to extract increasing volumes of overburden to get at those minerals. Uh, and in the case of coal, 200 years ago, it would have been economic to, to have about two tons of spoil for every ton of coal. Uh, nowadays, that ratio is more like 25 tons of overburden for one ton of coal. So increasingly, we're creating more and more waste as a byproduct of the extraction of those minerals. Uh, and so this, this figure here is actually trying to show um, how the, the total volumes of not only the minerals but the spoil has increased with time. 
So the total figures is the blue line. Currently, we're looking at about 100,000 million tons generated per year. And that's about 45 square kilometers, cubic kilometers, sorry, uh, volume. And, and uh, probably the, the interesting thing with this figure is that they, the inflection where the curve starts to really rise is 1945, so post-Second World War, with little blips because of economic crises. But it's on a, an exponential upward curve at present. More difficult to, to determine is the other major contributor to uh, artificial deposits uh, related to construction. Um, to determine that, what we've done is looked at uh, the, the global cement production figures, uh, which go back to about 1925. Uh, in 2004, the figures then suggested we had 2,000 million tons of cement produced in that year. So that's about two and a half tons of cement per person on this planet. Um, but again, that's only a small component of the, the construction industry because the, the, the cement is largely for production of, of concrete. So there you've got aggregate, mixtures of anything like four to one of aggregate. So immediately you're talking about 8 million tons of aggregate, 8,000 million tons of aggregate for that amount of cement. Uh, but we also have good statistics in the UK and US which then say um, what the ratio between the aggregates present in the concrete is re in relationship to other uses of aggregates. So that's the hard top on roads, uh, things like bulk fill. Um, and if you use those as projections, then again we're looking at figures of about 95,000 million tons per year. And, and the rise in this production has really kicked off again 1945. So just to summarize, what we're calling artificial deposits, not the anthropogenic that Tony was talking about, but the artificial deposits we've created, um, will include both novel uh, and natural deposits, uh, and increase, increasingly is including the subsurface as well. The annual genesis, if you just take those two components, and that's only two components, uh, we're not talking about landfill, uh, we're not talking about the general movement of materials around landscaping from uh, within a local area, we're talking about 200,000 million tons, um, as opposed to estimates of about 20,000 million tons for river transport into the oceans per year. So it's at least 10 times greater. The rates of change have, have tended to increase dramatically from 1945, and coincidentally, that, that coincides with Will Steffen's The Great Acceleration of the Anthropocene. So we might contend that this is a, a particular date that we might consider to be the start of the Anthropocene. Thank you. At this point, we'll open it up for questions. Does anyone have a question for our panel? And we have some other experts in the audience as well. Would you call this uh, an era, an epoch, or a period, and why? It's been considered at this stage as, as, an, as an epoch. Um, and I suppose the, it's the scale of the issue here as to whether we're still within the quaternary or is that, that era finished? And this is this context that you're looking at of are we still within this period where we don't want to then consider that we're something completely separate from it. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a natural progression throughout the, the whole scene of increasing human influence. Um, and it's, it's a diachronous relationship that's changing certain parts of the planet. So it's, it's the sort of the, the Euphrates breadbasket initially, um, and has moved out. It's become westernized. North America, Europe have been the main influences, and gradually now expanding out into Asia, uh, eventually into Africa. These, these areas are all going to... So it's a, it's a, it's a gradual change. Um, and so really, what, whether you want to consider this to be a major game-changer, the Anthropocene should be so different from earlier times, or whether it's just an, another stage within that development. Probably, probably more significant, I might suggest, is should we become extinct rapidly, then that's going to be a very dramatic change. And so the, the period after the Anthropocene is maybe even more significant, and that might represent a period boundary. Uh, Harvey Leifert, uh, Freelance. None of you uh, referred to the atmosphere 
as something that might be relevant in determining human impacts on our total Earth environment, uh, climate change, uh, obviously. Uh, I was wondering if that could be or should be relevant in determining whether we're in a new epoch. It, it, it does indirectly, certainly, because um, what, what comes down from the atmosphere is, is uh, isotopes of carbon um, that are peculiar to, to anthropogenic uh, changing. Uh, we fix, of course, an enormous amount of nitrogen from the atmosphere, which makes its way down into sediments and has downstream consequences. I think we don't talk about it in a direct way because we don't preserve the atmosphere, but we preserve the downstream consequences of changing the atmosphere. And that, in a sense, is the problem. Because the atmosphere is not a direct uh, marker in the geological column. It's, it's indirectly there, of course. Uh, it's very difficult to use it. Also, we have to remember that we're not out of the total temperature envelope yet. Uh, we may well be, but uh, obviously we should think of you know, the Eocene thermal maximum. So it, that we have a problem there. Also, of course, we're striving to control the rise in global temperatures. And so, ironically, if we did do that, would we then be out of the Anthropocene? So that is the fundamental reason that we all, of course, uh, uh, regard in it. It was the atmosphere that brought this whole issue to the front, but it does not make an easy way to divide up the geological column, either in the past or necessarily in the future. And the um, chemical markers to which I referred would be in great measure transported by atmospheric currents. That's how they be can become widespread, even outside of urban or industrial areas. Uh, we have a question from the internet from Liz Keller from Environmental Research Web. Her question is, who gets to make the final decision on whether it's an epoch? Um, the, the procedure so far, we've actually Could got, you speak into the microphone, sorry, please? Um, That's all right. Uh, my colleague, colleague Jan Zalizewicz, who's in the audience, actually is um, probably the, the, the chair for the first stage of this, uh, this um, process. Uh, he's the chair of the, the working party for the Anthropocene, and it's part of the subcommission for the quaternary. That reports to the International Commission on Stratigraphy, um, that, that probably is going to be something that's going to happen over the next four years or so. Uh, we'll gradually pull in more and more information. As a working party, we'll then uh, recommend um, should, should the concept of Anthropocene be accepted and what date we, we believe it should start. Um, that would then be discussed by the International Commission on Stratigraphy, and their decisions will then be passed on to um, the Inter International Union of, of Geological uh, Sciences. So, there's a whole chain of, chain of decision makers before it's accepted. It's not a, a small community that will make their mind up. Yes, thank you. John Karachewski, Freelance. Uh, very interesting presentations by all the speakers. I have two questions. Uh, one is you talked a lot about the alluvial deposits, and those are very interesting, but from a geologic perspective, uh, they often have a low preservation potential. And so I'm curious if you've looked at all in uh, any, say, shallow marine settings uh, for an urban imprint, like downstream of major urban areas. And the second one is a more detailed question, but uh, Michael, you talked about uh, the Mississippi River Delta, and you t showed chemical changes through time but I was curious how you could date those sediments on such a fine scale. So two very different questions. Shall I go with the first one? Yes, you can see it. I mean, in, in, for example, you can see the boundary in the southern part of the uh, North Sea in subsiding basins, uh, and you can see it uh, really off all the large catchment, all, of, all the large rivers that onto the con continental shelf. The, oh, you see, you see a change in the rate of sedimentation. Uh, a, an increase in the rate of sedimentation and a, and, a, and a complete change in the microfossils. So you go basically from the microfossils of the natural environment to the microfossils of the altered anthropogenic environment. So it's there on the continental shelf. More difficult is its reflection, I think this is an open question yet, is whether it's reflected off the continental shelf in terms of the marine record. That's a much more difficult question at the moment. But it's certainly there on the continental shelf. And, and also, I think that it is so widespread that 
This question about it having low preservation potential, well, alluvial deposits have very high preservation potential if they're in subsiding basins. So it depends where you are on the Earth's surface as to whether you'll get preservation of these sediments or not. So deltaic systems, you will get preservation of them. So they will enter the geological record. And I think even if we have glaciation sweeping down over North America and Northern Europe, it's very likely that we would see this difference in our record because we see a record of previous interglacials, even in areas that have been glaciated. So I think it will preserve both on land and also in the coastal, on the coastal record, maybe the deep sea, that's, that's something that we really have to look at more. Yeah, let, me, let me just add to that a little bit that um, Tony did mention the importance of deltaic environments. And, and remember, part of the Anthropocene is, is associated with a rising sea level. Um, so many deltas in the world are currently subsiding um, and being inundated more quickly than usual. And that's also compounded with the fact that some of these systems, like the Mississippi, for example, are, are not getting as much sediment as they used to because it's being partly held up in, in reservoir systems and being used for, for human activities elsewhere. So it's not always that the sedimentation rate increases in many of these systems, but there's a change in the sedimentation rate. And it's that change, whether it's an increase or decrease, that will be preserved in those rapidly subsiding systems. Yeah, um, on your first question, the first part of your, your question, the preservation potential, I think, is a really important issue. And um, I think the chemical marker approach, uh, of course, will be affected by that. And uh, places like Mississippi River Delta uh, would be you know, a very good place to go to, to, to look for these markers and to perhaps expect that we'd have fairly reasonable preservation. Um, in terms of the dating of that particular example, it's actually not my work, it's from the literature, but uh, they were using um, radiometric methods, lead 210 and cesium 137 in that particular case. Um, I'll put my context, which is the, the sort of direct human influence, and I'm obviously looking mostly onshore, but offshore as well. Um, you can consider things like the, the huge amount of, of dredging for fish um, offshore, uh, and the, the reworking of sediments is, is a direct human influence. Um, and you can go to places off Norway, say, where you think that maybe you're looking at a fairly pristine continental shelf, but not a square meter hasn't been dredged at least once. So again, we're seeing this evidence of what we might call amphorotubation of sediments. And then there's also the influence of, of direct human deposits, things like ballast from ships. So, so even their made ground is becoming something that we're recognizing. Yeah, I'm just going to, um, my name's Jan Zalashevich, by the way. Um, Sorry? Is it on? <laughs> okay, right, okay, is that better? Okay, right. <laughs> um, uh, uh, just to, sorry. Yes, my, uh, uh, my name's Jan Zalashevich at the University of Leicester in, in the UK. Uh, and just to add to Colin's point, uh, something that will um, uh, be mentioned in the Anthrop Anthropocene session uh, tomorrow morning, uh, the, the dredging of, of the seafloor uh, has gone now beyond the continental shelf. It goes onto the continental slopes. And there are some... Uh, spectacular images uh, of, uh, of landscapes uh, transformed and smoothed down to about a, a kilometer's water depth. Um, it, it's really quite striking, some of these subsea changes. Uh, and they will be effectively permanent because that, that is where sediment accumulates. Uh, Randy Shostak, reporter with EOS, uh, newspaper of the AGU. Uh, I wonder if uh, each of you could give a broad picture perspective on what are your overall thoughts and concerns, whether personal, professional, about the Earth apparently entering this new epoch? I'm, I'm, I'll be brave enough to start that one. <laughs> Let these guys think about it. Um, for me, this is, and beyond the geological aspects of it, it's, it's a mechanism to bring a number of different communities to the same table to talk about issues that are tightly coupled. Um, and so I mentioned in my couple of minutes of intro that, that this engages the, uh, the regulatory uh, uh, um, systems. Um, it engages ph philosophers too. In fact, one of our speakers uh, or, or presenters tomorrow is a philosopher and engages social economics 
folks. Um, and to get those different communities to the same table is, is, is a constant challenge. Um, so in a broad picture, this is, this is partly what motivates me. In a very similar vein, I mean, my, my background is both in, in, uh, in, in environmental science and also in, in archaeology. And if you take a geological view, the change that's occurred during the last 10,000 years through the, the uh, change, you know, the evolution of Homo sapiens, obviously earlier in the Pleistocene, but then the profound changes that seem to have occurred at the beginning of the, at the end of the last glacial period, and then which led at different places at different times to agriculture is a profound beginning of a change in earth history. Now, that leads us to a philosophical problem about how you define the beginning of something if you're sort of in the middle of it. But I have a feeling that if we were here in a million years' time, which is a bit unlikely, although the AGU is a very long-lived establishment, <laughs> uh, we might look back and we would see a massive change that occurred what we would, might say was in the late Pleistocene, or we one might say, well, we would then identify a, a geological boundary because everything would be different from then on. And that fundamentally is driven by the lagged response of population and industrialization, which itself was driven by the emergence of agriculture. And so that is a fun, that seems to me is a profoundly geological phenomena because it involves both evolution extinction, speciation, and uh, a change in the Earth's dynamics. And therefore, it has to exist. <laughs> it's bound, we are bound to be in the Anthropocene. The question is how we deal with that in relation to the way that we view past Earth science. And, th and that is a profoundly interesting question about boundaries and about how we identify periods. Because it is always a combination between pragmatics and later understanding. You never understand everything, so you, but you always have to make a decision. And if we look back on the geological column now, we know that we keep really wanting to tinker with those boundaries. We've only, <laughs> after all, just recently established two of them, which are relevant to this discussion. One is the base of the Pleistocene, and the other is the base of the Holocene. We've only just recently established them. And they've been around for, obviously, quite a lot long, longer than that. So it is not surprising that it is a very difficult issue how you recognize this massive change in the Earth system when you're basically right at the beginning of it. Right. So I would say not only is it a geological boundary that we're crossing, but maybe an intellectual one also, and that's our immediate experience, and that's quite exciting. And it's an opportunity for our science, Earth, as Earth scientists, to, to indeed talk with philosophers and um, economists and politicians and um, to, to offer our perspective of the long view. Offer our perspective of the long view. In other words, imagine ourselves 20 million years hence, looking back. And uh, perhaps that can help modify our collective behavior and uh, make it a bit more benign than it is at the moment. So perhaps that's a contribution we could make. Um, I suppose I have to give a, a political answer, which is, is based on my position as secretary of the, the working party, um, that I've got to be very dispassionate here. I'm not meant to have a, an opinion either way. I mean, I, I'm presenting some information which is relevant to my own personal studies. Um, but we are, we're currently producing a, a volume for the Geological Society, which is dealing on this issue of stratigraphy uh, in the Anthropocene. Um, and we have to take on board everybody's uh, standpoints, and then the nice thing for me is being able to take um, consideration of sciences which are something that I'm not particularly familiar with, uh, and understanding how other people, say an archaeologist, would view this as opposed to a geologist. Um, so at present, I have, I have no no fixed opinions, um, and I'm just keen to see the input from other scientists. M my own personal background is actually the physical mapping of deposits that that man is making, um, and the, the general background, why we're interested, is more to do with uh, is that land stable, is it good, con uh, good ground conditions for building on, is it associated with contamination? Um, so it's these sort of additional aspects which I find particularly interesting. And, and that, at the end of the day, is irrelevant as to whether it's called an Anthropocene deposit. 
it's, it's a physical man-made deposit which has a great influence on us. And, and to be honest, to an extent, more so than many other geological units, because it's what's at the surface. I think someone already answered it, actually. Uh, yes, I, I, I think I agree with all, all of that that's been said in its various ways. Uh, just one thing is, is that the, we're talking about the, uh, the Anthropocene as, as being uh, 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 complex you know, and, and problematic. Um, well, I, I think in that it is like any other geological boundary. You know, Earth history is complicated um, and messy. Uh, and and uh, I can think of no geological boundary that has not been controversial in some way or other in deciding where to select the level to define it at. Uh, so with the Anthropocene, we are simply going through exactly the same process, um, rather closer to home. <laughs> Just to add to that, I mean, if we're looking at uh, events which are, say, 300 million years ago, the level of accuracy of trying to pinpoint that boundary is, is hundreds of thousands of years, and we're quibbling now in you know, decades uh, as to how precise we're going to be. So we have a difficulty because we are so close to this topic. Well, thank you very much um, to our panel and, and to you guys. Uh, our next press conference will be a media availability with the NSF director, Subras Resch. That's at 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, it's a different time for our press conferences. But we'll see you then at 2.